Okay, let me break it down for you. Judgment, prejudice, bias, it all still exists. If I want to take this huge, overwhelming problem, I have to start with myself. Finally clicked for me. Compassion is a necessity. the very fringes of our solar system. It was taken by the astronomer Carl Sagan from the Voyager 1 space probe in 1990. Now can anyone spot the pale blue dot? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> That's it. That's us. The blue planet with an indigo sky and an azure sea. Now not only can blue signify the Big Bang, it can act as a metaphor for our psyche. It can express beauty and art and play a role in our history and culture. It can even define our fundamental ethical and political laws. I'm here today to talk to you about the essence of a color that has stirred my emotions and can perhaps change the way you behave, but has definitely altered the course of our existence. The story of blue is at its heart intertwined with the human ability to imagine, to create, and to innovate. For there was a time when no physical entity, no tangible entity of blue was known to us, besides that of our sky and our sea. We had to literally wait for a great storm to pass, to bask in the light of the dream blue atmosphere above or climb the summit of a mountain to relish in the vastness of the cool blue ocean below. To physically have and to hold blue was near to impossible. For when you neared water or air, it turned clearer and the further blue retreated. You can liken this to the endless grasp of the horizon, a point which you will always see but can never reach. Now the only way in which we perceive the blue our natural blue of the sky and the sea is due to a natural phenomena where the mere reception of different wavelengths of light reflecting off of objects presents itself in color. Now each and every object observes light differently and thus we perceive different objects with different colors. So can anyone perhaps tell me or does anyone know what natural um, what natural element in this earth can create a blue pigment? F? Sorry? Yes. <laughs> Good. In fact, it's the only element known to us which we can derive a solid plain blue pigment from. And that's it. However, incredibly so, before this element was ever discovered by humans, we can actually artificially reproduce the blue color. Now this to me underlines a very, very human desire. A desire to materialize that which perhaps is magical and mystical, for it to transcend to something more rational and even integral. Let me take you back 6,500 years ago to the remote Sarisang mines of Afghanistan for you to truly understand the historic lineage associated with the material usage of our blue pigment. For the discovery of lapis lazuli brought an omnipresence of color into the very hand of man. For the first time, we were not only able to only see blue, but we could touch blue. And as hands innately do, we harness the lapis lazuli. We pass the semi-precious stone on from one to another, and ultimately, we utilize the material. But before this ever happened, as I previously stated, ancient Egyptian engineers had actually artificially created a synthetic blue pigment through progressive chemistry, known as Egyptian blue. So the very first artifacts that we can find which are blue are, for example, from the ancient Egyptian era, like this piece of faience, but also scarabi and ancient wall paintings. Here, blue symbolized the connection to the spiritual realm, to rebirth, to fertility, and to creation. 
and soon the knowledge was passed by traders over land and sea until it became an integral part of our economy and our culture. Now this made me wonder, how did one of the rarest, if not the rarest color known to us in nature become what we regard today as one of our primary colors? <laughs> I'm going to take you to Venice around the 10th century AD. Venice at the time was the epicenter of merchants and artists. So this connection brought a great invention to us. Namely, the traders and the merchants brought over these precious lapis lazuli stones, and the art artists harnessed them to create the very first blue paint called ultramarine, which literally meant from across the Mediterranean. The first Renaissance painter that utilized ultramarine was Giotto di Bondone. Here you can see a wall painting of him in Assisi in the St. Francis Basilica. Giotto had completely cascaded the entire dome of the same basilica in the most precious ultramarine. And as you can see, he had also dusted it with golden stars to resemble the sky. But if we look even closer, we can also see that he depicted the Virgin Mary up there, which tells us that he not only wanted to resemble the sky, he thought of the heaven as blue. This was the first time an artist had associated the color blue to a, religi a religious con connection. Also, what we can derive is that the Virgin Mary's cloak was also depicted in blue, symbolizing its effect as a divine and royal color. So divine and royal that it actually became banned from the common man's use. Now, this experience in Assisi was actually my first experience with the power, <laughs> the undeniable power of blue. For when I entered that chapel a few years back, I realized that it had suspended my mind of all its thoughts. And I sat there the whole day looking up just into this vast blue ceiling. And I came back the next day just to meditate and marvel under it again. So at this point in history, we can tell that blue primarily functioned as a theor theological role. It wasn't until the 16th century, however, that the color of blue renewed its meaning before the Enlightened Era and found its reason. Here, we have an artist called Tiziano Vecellio who depicted the story of Bacchus and Ariadne from Greek mythology. Daringly, he didn't only use blue to paint the entire sky, <laughs> the mountains, the horizon, and the sea, no, he also used blue to actually depict Ariadne and her following, or follower in a very revealing blue robe. Previously, only the Virgin, uh, Virgin Mary was able to wear a blue robe. So here blue t took a stance and made a statement. It revolutionized the color and broke it from its boundaries. Um, much like the role it could play later on in history, if we take a look at blue and dress, we come to a point, for example, in the French Revolution, where the color unified the French Revolution um, government's army and created a unified strong front. Now this trend would continue. And even if we think of modern days, think of our blue collar workers or our blue suited politicians, what role does blue play in their dress? Perhaps the workers aren't the only ones here using blue to conceal any stains. So at this point, um, blue had evolved from symbolizing something, something divine and royal and had now come to symbolize the liberated and the revolutionary. It acted as a primarily political medium. Let's jump ahead to the 19th century to a well-known time period called the Blue Period. Yes, we're going to analyze Pablo Picasso to truly understand the psychological attributes of the color blue. The Blue Period dramatizes Pablo Picasso's emotions at the time of loss and despair, for he had just lost his dear friend Cascamas, and he was an outcast of society. This painting, as scholars say, 
um, shows his new statement as an artist. The term at that time was called la homme maudite, meaning dissociated from society, yet superior to it. It is also called la vie, symbolizing his life. The next painting is called the old guitar player. And here we can start to sense the intense sadness rival the intense use of blue. So intensely so, that the psychoanalyst Carl Jung released a statement reflecting on the exploitation of blue and saying that it reflected the chaos of the time and for Picasso, his descent into schizophrenia. Now the last artwork is of a girl in a chemise. Here we see a beauty drowning in an ocean of blue and quite a dirty one too for on your left and right you can see the new synthetic pigments of blue um, introduced and they hinge a bit more on green but we can also see the start of a new color appearing in his work if you look at her lips there's a soft rose this tells us that picasso was literally painting out of his depression that he used blue as a medium for catharsis he was leaving his blue period and entering his rose period so at this point in history now blue signifies a metaphor for our psyche our next artwork in the story of blue is a composition by Arnold Schoenberg and it's called Blue Self-Portrait. Now I call it a composition because Schoenberg was first and foremost a modernist composer. He was also a lover, friends with Vasily Kandinsky, a member of the Blue Writers Group, which formed around 1910. The artists of the Blue Writers Group desired to express spiritual truths, truths <laughs> through the connection between art and music. For these artists, blue is the color of spirituality. They believe the richer the hue of the blue, the deeper it symbolizes the eternal craving for the infinity. And now let's talk about, an, about another association of music and blue. And you can probably guess where I'm heading. We're entering the blues. The blues was a musical genre and form associated with African high life and the Negro spirituals in America around the 19th century, at the start of that. These enslaved people were expressing their souls through the blues. Their music allowed them to let go and created a space for new opportunities. They were literally covered in red stains left by the ch shackles on their ankles and their wrists, and their sins were left burning red by the devil they had met at the crossroads. They needed blue to counteract, to console, and to cleanse them. Here, at this stage, blue had primarily come to change the course of history. For in the 30s, it defied racial politics through the blues, and it would lead into the 70s psychedelic blues, where it awakened its youth from societal bonds. The following artwork, called Blue Monochrome, which is created entirely from the pigment International Klein Blue, was created by the French conceptual artist Yves Klein. Um, he used a very modern technique to transcend the luster that a lapis lazuli had into the pink formation. Whereas prior, Renaissance painting couldn't really translate the shine and the luster of it to create a deep luminescent ultramarine, but he did it, and he called it International Plan Blue. The difficulty of representing this intense color is actually integral to Klein's intention to utilize it as a vehicle um, conveying immateri immateriality in space. He describes his work as embodying blue in itself, disengaged from all functional justification. And he likened blue monochrome to an open window to freedom and equated it with the void. Similarly, an English director and writer called Jim Jarman, oops, Derek Jarman, <laughs> um, produced a window of experience using only international client blue in 1993, and he named it Blue. For months after, sorry, four months after, however, tragically, Derek Jarman had died from AIDS, a condition which also left him partially blind throughout his suffering. He felt the blue reflected his condition, and while the film remains empty, the saturated visual experience is actually filled with imaginative projections and narration. Let me explain to you just why. 
Interest interestingly, <laughs> when watching this film, the retina of one's eyes, eyes tire from the intense saturation of one color and produces bursts of blues complementary, namely orange, so that it fills its screen with imaginary projections. Here the color blue simply expresses the richness of imagery and an idea of the material that it calls forth. Through art, blue had now primarily been likened to the concept of infinity, however also challenged the confines of mortality. Next is the contemporary artist called Anish Kapoor. He is largely known for his, sculpt uh, his sculptural forms coated in purely pigment. This one is called A Wing at the Heart of Things. From a phenomenological point of view, your eyes can't quite focus on blue, which I just mentioned, and which in effect allows us to generate an equivalent sensation for that pertaining to uncertainty. He associates the color with an absence of light, observing that blue much more deeply reveals darkness than, than does black. We can ponder this when looking at his later art artwork called Dissension. And finally, this piece by Anish Kapoor is called Sky Mirror. And it simply and beautifully brings down a piece of our sky on Earth and reflects the continuous flux of our environment. Now, at this point in time, fluids come to emulate our knowledge. And so, the last artwork I'm going to talk to you about tonight in the art historic account of the material usage of the blue pigment is called Blueism. In fact, it is the installation you might have walked around in earlier today and will hopefully lie down in later this evening. It is the result of throwing oneself into the abyss that is blue, which for this year has been both my physical and mental hobby. And much to my dismay, what I learned was that its immensity was as incomprehensible as that which it most undeniably represented, the pale blue dot. The blue planet is my reality. When I look at its precious sea, I am gifted with the reflection of our ethereal sky. But not only this, I am also gifted with the ability to see myself between these two elements. And this gives me the sense that nature is almost telling me and revealing to me our connection, it wants us to know our relationship and interconnectedness and our mutual dependency on one another. For if the water and air within us isn't pure, the water and air around us won't be either. How would you reflect upon yourself if that image starts to get polluted in all sensitive senses of the word? So I ask this of you. Please, just for a moment, set aside your daily activities. Open your eyes and step inside the blue realm deliberately. My material dome is nothing but a microcosm of our celestial dome. It is an abstract of our seas and our sky, our sustainability and our circularity. It signifies our clarity, our depths, our complexities, and our unity. Blue represents our culture and our infinity. Let's make sure we sustain the natural blue of our skies and our sea. We cannot take it for granted. So, why is blue one of our primary colors? Well, by matter of fact, it always has been. It is simply an axiom of color. But we were only able to truly understand this when we finally materialized it. Thank you.